R.E.M. is one of the few rock bands that really made it big without losing their street credibility. This alone is quite an achievement. And yet, the 90 million records sold by these four gentlemen don't look as impressive as the record they set tonight. I have never told so hard to pick five best songs out of any other act's catalog as I have for R.E.M.'s. After days of pondering whether or not a given song should make it to the list, I gave up. Sorry, Top Patters, the title of this video is misleading. These are not the best five R.E.M. songs according to me. These are the five R.E.M. songs that haunted me the most through the years. When I'm happy, when I'm sad, when something happens, when I'm washing dishes, but are they also good pieces of music? Ah, you need to see this video to its end to find that out. Bang and Blame concludes the second third of Monster, an album saluted as an underrated masterpiece in too many YouTube comments. Monster has its moments and this is its peak. It's loud and bombastic like other songs on Monster, but it is also slow and hypnotic, multi-layered, subtle at times. It kind of connects with the undercurrent of melancholia of many of R.E.M.'s best songs. Their southern gothic connection, I like to call it. Bang and Blame revolves around Mike Mills' bass riff, that and the explosive guitar-driven chorus. It's not like Michael Stipe and Bill Berry are just sitting there, though. Berry first underlines Mills' bass line perfectly and sparsely, then, in the chorus, comes up with some propelling and interesting roles for the fills. Stipe waves the song tapestry further with his lyrics and stern delivery. Bang and Blame talks about finger pointing, betrayal and violence, itself pointing a finger. In a sense, it does come out of grunge, out of the preoccupation with hypocrisy and the idiocies of our post-capitalist society, then still in its infancy. But, and here the song reveals R.E.M.'s more mature age and their being big brothers of the grunge generation, the whole song is very composed, almost collected. Even when Peter Buck's noise-heavy solo breaks out, it seems regimented. It's not like, say, Lane Stiley's primordial voice returning after the solo section in Woods. Everything is very pop. In the best sense, this song is not an empty gesture, though. It's like Bang and Blame has R.E.M. reflecting on the then-current state of affairs in the West, a bit like the Beatles' revolution for 1968 youth culture. It's not my thing, so let it go was the new Don't You Know That You Can Count Me Out then? This spot should have been for night swimming, the song that I love the most in Automatic for the People. And yet, time and again, its sweetness follows that keep popping out in my head the most. I can actually recall the first time I noticed the song. It was 1995. I had borrowed a cassette of Automatic for the People from my aunt. I was playing it non-stop while I was devouring Video Girl Eye. You should give that manga a chance, if you can. Anyhow, I was deep into reading, but at one point I stopped and I realized the song playing in the background was really something. It was Sweetness Follows. At the time I could not make out all the lyrics. I thought it was a song speaking of the cycle of life, of nature's great forces, of what goes on inside our souls. Years later I discovered that it's about death. I mean, you just have to take a look at the lyrics sheet, right? Sweetness Follows is about someone trying to cope with loss. The song message gets home because there's plenty of dissonance in the music. We understand that the lyrics are not just empty words. 
Yeah, live your life with joy and wonder, mate. Sweetness follows, right? The pain is real. And it's always there, about to resurface. But however tough, we must go on. When I realized the meaning of the song, I had a laugh to myself. Through the years, when I got stuck or things weren't going well at all, sometimes I could hear in my head, Ho, ho, sweetness follows. Who knows, maybe it will follow for real. I will tell you when I get there. The track opening Fables of the Reconstruction, feeling gravity's pull, is the stronger opening of any R.E.M. album. The initial guitar riff is an immediate attention grabber. Notice that it is both muscular and effect drenched, like the guitar sound on Monster, but this is immensely more focused than anything on that album. If the guitar riff wasn't enough after the first line of lyrics, the bass and drums kick in and boy, it feels like a juggernaut has been put in motion. This is not just a great rock song, this is psychedelia done right. The music, the lyrics, the production all seems geared to capture a borderline moment, the one connecting sleep and wakefulness. The verse section is rough, as if there was some inner conflict between conscious and subconscious, alertness and dreams. The main character seems at once victim of outside forces and scenery and empowered to do something with and through them. But then the C-section comes. What do you call the C-section in pop jargon? Bridge? Is it the bridge? But then the bridge comes and it is so sweet. I think that is what I like the most in R.E.M.'s music that it can be incredibly sweet and that they make you appreciate this sweetness by building it up. Here, time almost slows down and opens up and you are left with this cushion of sonic flowers blooming and the perfect meshing of Stipes and Mills' voices. Beautiful. After a return to the verse and chorus, the song ends with the addition of a string section. It builds out of the second bridge, menacing, brooming, ending the song with a monumental gesture that makes it even more memorable. Until this morning, her shirt was at the top of this list. It's the highlight of Green as far as I'm concerned. The best song in a record filled with great tracks. Her shirt is a love song intellectual like only a Michael Stipe set of lyrics can be. I mean, dragging hair shirts in a pop song, hair shirts were garments made of rough animal hair worn during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance by penance to expiate their sins or to affirm their fate and that kind of jazz. And how about this black carbon test Stipe is going on about? To this day, I still have to find an explanation of what that really is. Some say it's a test for the purity of black ink. Some say it's about the quality of rubbers and tires. Anyhow, this is not a happy love song. The relationship is not really working. And the two lovers might be better off calling the whole thing off. There's plenty of suffering hence the reference to hair shirts, and the thought that it's a beautiful life, perhaps too beautiful to spend it proving one's love or repenting for imaginary sins. What makes the song really stand out for me is the musical part. The melody ebbs and flows like the waves of the sea and like the shifting focus in the lyrics. The mandolin progression is ethereal. The organ sustains and wraps the whole sound up. The bass, played by Bill Berry, is really sparse, but it's fundamental. It repeats the same three notes over and over during the whole song, regardless of the section. Thus, Berry provides both tension and an anchor to the music. The listener almost forgets about the instrument replace a precious subconscious part to enrich this acoustic masterpiece. Jungle, 
Don't go back to Rockville is the piece that stole the crown to her shirt. I couldn't take it out of my head for a week after listening to it while I was preparing this video. I took the hint. The song is also a great example of what I meant with R.E.M.'s Southern Gothic connection. It's not disturbing or grotesque, it's not violent, nor connected with the occult, but there's a shifting focus, a restlessness. This feeling of confused melancholia, longing for the past, but also for a future that might never be. In Don't Go Back to Rockville, somebody's leaving because they want to be alone by themselves. They'll go where nobody knows them. And if that first destination is not far enough, they'll go further away. Oh dear, tell me you never felt like that in your life and I'll call you lucky. But there is also another point of view. The narrator. A guy appears in the second verse describing his solitude. He's being left alone by his friend or lover or whatever the person living was for him. This fractured point of view mirrors the confusion in the lyrics. There's the certainty that the person who left won't find their place. They'll come back. There's the realization that the narrator might not really need the other person. Perhaps he just needs somebody else, anyone else. But there's also the desire to stick it to the other people in town those that only want to bring you down. And of course, the chorus says, don't go back, you'll waste another year. What am I supposed to do? I can listen to Rockville time and again, back to back. And after listening to many Rockville covers by other people and to many live versions by R.E.M. themselves, I understood. It's the piano, stupid. Seriously, it's the piano part that makes everything work so well. It bends the country influences into a popular territory. It makes a song about loneliness and confusion a bit sweeter and more upbeat. The main guitar part is also interesting for a small detail. It seems Peter Buck is playing it the way he will play mandolin further down the line. This might not be the only example of this way of playing in the early days, but in Rockville, is in your face. And it was certainly different from Bach's usual early offerings. His signature arpeggios everywhere style featured in the second guitar part. Anyhow, Don't Go Back to Rockville is a beautiful song and a great way to end this video. But first, if you like this little rumble of mine, please like the video and why not? I see your friends, so they watch it too. If you disagree with its content and you can't believe how I could leave out Near Wild Devon or any of the dozen of songs that I could have easily featured here, write me a comment with your top 5 list. After all, like I say, these videos are just conversation starters or a way to single some songs out to people who want to get into a band they don't know. See you soon for more music-related videos on this very channel. This was Simon Mas, your friend with a music degree and a heartfelt message. Stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love.